Hello, everybody. Is it on? Yeah, okay. And welcome. If you would like to discuss civil society uh, participation in international uh, fora on internet governance and the inclusive inclusiveness of these spaces, you're in the right room. Uh, I see that this is the time where everybody would rather take a nap with a jet lag than <laughs> <laughs> discuss serious topics, but uh, we do have a wonderful panel and a good topic today, so I hope you will all be engaged. Um, and um, we see this uh, as an open forum, as a dialogue, as a learning experience, and we'd like to hear as much from you, and I see a lot of uh, expertise in the room, as from our panel. And let me kick us off then with um, introducing myself. So <laughs> my name is Pavlina Edelson. I'm the executive director of Diplo US. And I'll be moderating this session and also speaking on behalf of Diplo Foundation. Um, we have Peter Marion, team leader of digital governance, uh, unit five in science technology innovation at DG INTPA. We have Teresa, IGF MAG member, GFC outreach manager, and esteemed board member of Diplo US. Um, then we have Victor Capillo, member of the Board of Trustees of Kenya ICT Action Network. And Marlena Wisniak, Senior Advisor at Digital Rights of uh, European Center for Nonprofit Law, ECNL. We also have online participation, and uh, my colleague Sita Laxmi is as a moderator, who will come in with the questions from online. So, what are we going to be talking about? We will discuss in this session um, a new initiative by the European Commission, where Diplo Foundation is a part of, um, and the new project, Civil Society Alliances for Digital Empowerment, CAID, led by Diplo Foundation, working with nine partners globally that aims to increase participation of the civil society in international IG processes, which is funded by European Commission. We have partners at this table and some in the audience as well, uh, they are Forest International, ECNL, CIPESA, Kiktonet, Savoir Fusion, Vision Ch for Change, SMEX, Fundacion Carisma, and PICAISOC. So quite, quite a big group and uh, quite a diversity of views on our ends. So our aim is um, to discuss how to improve and enhance engagement of civil society organizations in multi-stakeholder forums. What challenges do civil society face in meaningful engagement? And also, how can we bring in the perspective of Global South, civil society into the international multi-stakeholder forums? Specifically, we will talk also about standardization forums at ITU, IETF, and ICANN. So, um, with this, I would ask Peter to start us off with a short introduction, please. Thank you very much. <coughs> good afternoon, everybody, or maybe people online. Good morning or good evening. Um, thanks a lot for for giving me um, the f you know the, the mic. I'm I think I'm probably the least um, knowledgeable in the room on the topic. Uh, so, but anyway, I'm I'm glad to to kick it off. Um, so maybe a bit of context, uh, because uh, as was mentioned, we are we are going we are moving into um, uh, a new project on this topic, and I just like to shape a little bit how we got to that point. So about three years ago, the topic of digital became a priority for the European Commission. And uh, in my DG International Partnerships, we were looking at how to best uh, approach uh, this topic to work at this. Specifically, <coughs> um, we're looking at this topic at the global level, national level, regional level, and of course, at different thematic uh, levels. Um, and when we looked at this specific topic, um, we always look at this through our lens of a human-centric digital development. And that means that, of course, uh, you know, the, the human is centric, not the state, not the company. And also, um, as you've probably heard many times before, we, we are aiming at tackling the digital uh, divide. So very soon we, we came on this topic of you know, global uh, digital governance. What, what does this mean? Uh, this was quite new to us. This is also why I have to stress we are in still in learning mode. Um, <coughs> and um, another uh, aspect of our approach is that we wanted to look at this topic from a multilateral point of view and also from a multi-stakeholder point of view. And um, this is key. Uh, you know, EU is a very strong proponent of the multi-stakeholder approach. 
IGF processes and others. But we also looked at this through the multilateral approach. And when we um, started looking at this multilateral level, we noticed that um, even though everybody claims to be proponents of the multi-stakeholder model, uh, maybe not all the actors in the multi-stakeholder you know, uh, prism are there. And so specifically, we thought that uh, maybe on the topic of um, civil society, um, that that could be um, a topic that we would like to see uh, worked on. So, I was talking about digital, but of course, on the other hand, the EU is a strong proponent of civil society in general. So I won't go too deep into that, but um, for us it's clear that in the absence of a strong participation of civil society, um, we tend to see, if you look at history or even today, we, we tend to see societies drifting off in, in directions that are not uh, aligned with our human-centric model, let's say, or with our free democratic societies. So, okay. Um, so this is a bit where we come from. So then the question was, okay, on global digital government, who, who needs to be around the table? Uh, we were looking at this UN agencies, um, and um, we also noticed that there are actors out there which are pushing some of these discussions into the intergovernmental sphere. Uh, also at this IGF, I think this is a topic uh, that's coming up quite a lot. And um, so we just want to emphasize again that, that we really would like to have certain discussions, global discussions, at the multi-stakeholder uh, level. Um, we're the first proponent worldwide for the multilateral system, don't get us wrong, but certain discussions should not just be intergovernmental. And so um, this is where we are. Now, when we looked at, um, okay, how shall we approach then the topic of civil society, I'm sure we will get back uh, in more detail into that later, but just a few things. On the one hand, we noticed um, possibly a lack of uh, know-how on the topic um, and a lack of capacity. Now, I have to say, we face the same issues internally. So this is not something that is only for civil society organizations. Even in our own DG, in our own unit, there are very few people that actually know this topic. And we actually barely have resources to cover this. So it's not unique. Um, that's the first thing. The second was that um, even though civil society was present, then maybe not at the, the, the volume, so at the amount that we wanted. So I'll not go too much into that now. Um, OK, just to emphasize also that for us, in our perspective, when we talk about digital, we link this to the topic of rights fundamental rights. So this is fundamental for any of our discussions that wherever, whatever we talk about, in the end it has to be aligned with our views on, on a rights-based approach. Um, basically also aligned with the UN Charter of Human Rights. Uh, and that underpins many of the discussions that we, that we can have uh, afterwards. And then um, another thing is that we wanted to make sure that the Global South is involved. Because when we looked at the capacity, there are actually actors also in civil society that are very knowledgeable, uh, that have a track record, but that was not, uh, I mean, we saw then maybe gaps in the, in the global south. So we wanted to work on that. Last thing, I'm almost finished. This program <laughs> for us uh, has to be, we position this in an, in an overall program where we work on digital and multilateral. So digital and multilateral. And so in that context, just for information, we're also working with ITU and UNDP. So I mean, we have, um, you know, we're funding them for ac actions on, on digital and multilateral. ITU, UNDP, also OHCHR on, on rights, UNESCO. And we're also working with the, with the tech envoy. Um, of course, we're working with EU member states. And then as was mentioned, and this is quite new, so this is the first time for us, on this specific topic, we, we now have two actions that will start soon, and one is indeed with under the leadership, well, uh, you know, chaired by, by Diplo, as was uh, explained. So thank you so much, and I'll pass the word back. Thank you, Peter, and uh, we certainly appreciate your insight on how European Commission views the participation of civil society. I think it uh, resonates a lot with what we see in the field as well. And we certainly uh, agree, working with the small and developing states, that the capacity problem is not only on the side of civil society, 
but with fragmentation of different forums and shifting things, uh, it, it is an overall problem which needs addressing. Um, with that, let's go to Teresa <laughs> uh, with her IGF mag hat to tell us more about how um, the International Forum sees this problem. Thank you very much, Pavlina. Thanks also, uh, Peter. Well, uh, first of all, congratulations, uh, not only uh, to the grantee, and a good one, and with excellent consortium, but also for um, you, know, you as the donor recognizing uh, the issue and the problem, uh, and deciding to make it a priority, because it is important. Um, you know, I will start with a few reflections on why I feel, in general, inputs of civil society um, are essential <laughs> in, the, uh, in the various policy processes uh, that, uh, that we are dealing with. Uh, you know, of course, um, you know, many of the deliberations uh, that are happening here um, uh, at Fora, like uh, Pavlina has mentioned, you know, uh, actually uh, you know, uh, impact the individual. <laughs> and it's often the civil society organizations that, uh, uh, that have uh, the interest of, of the individuals uh, uh, really close, uh, close to their heart. Um, but beyond this kind of existential reasoning, uh, I feel that more and more uh, we are moving in some kind of a general culture uh, of multi-stakeholderism and uh, you know, that leading hopefully uh, to uh, kind of more efficient coordination mechanisms. So um, you know, basically with a few exceptions of some very hard policy issues, uh, it's very difficult uh, to think of a policy process that wouldn't benefit from multiple perspectives, from uh, multiple stakeholder groups, uh, obviously, uh, including uh, civil society, which can uh, ultimately lead uh, to better and more informed uh, policy making. So, um, you know, even if you, like, we are talking here about civil society, but, you know, uh, think also about other stakeholder groups, like, for instance, how, how absurd would it be to discuss uh, some digital policy uh, developments without um, uh, being in touch with the private sector, you know, so uh, I, I feel that the same absurdity would stand for not consulting the civil society. So uh, I'm wearing a couple of hats today, <laughs> as Pavlina mentioned. Uh, you know, uh, one hat is uh, ex-Diplo, uh, current uh, board member uh, of Diplo US. Uh, the second one, uh, Pavlina said, um, uh, IGF Mac member. But actually, as of this morning, that's not the case because uh, <laughs> I have served uh, my my three years. Yes, but um, uh, I hope uh, that uh, it still allows me to um, provide some perspectives uh, on on the current forum. So um, IGF uh, is very traditionally dominated by civil society uh, participation. <laughs> it's not the stakeholder group that the IGF is struggling with. There are actually other stakeholder groups where, uh, where the struggle is, uh, is more, uh, more of an issue. So in this sense, really, I feel uh, it is a safe stay space and also the magic space, <laughs> in a way, um, for, for civil society uh, to allow uh, to engage with others without the pressure of necessarily kind of having a negotiation or, or a very very concrete uh, outcome uh, in this uh, in this regard. So, mm. and that's something that definitely uh, should be protected, uh, you know. And I'm really curious once uh, this IGF is over, you know, how the chart of the various stakeholder representation will will look like. But uh, but uh, as usual, I, I will I will expect very very heavy domination of civil society. Um, that's also why civil society, and maybe rightly so, uh, is very defensive about any kind of, um, yeah, uh, how, to, how to put it, you know, maybe some concerns uh, about the, the future of the, of the IGF, yeah? So you will, you will really hear uh, a lot of voices uh, you're hearing already and will we'll hear in the, in the coming months uh, uh, even more. Because at this moment there is no equivalent uh, to, uh, to a space like the Internet Governance Forum where, where civil society could have so much uh, opportunities uh, to express and in a way to also influence uh, the the discourse uh, on the on the issues uh, that are here uh, i'm happy then to go more in detail about how it actually works what's the role of the mag uh, in this sense but uh, but that's uh, that's maybe if we have time 
Uh, and the last hat I'm wearing, and allow me just a very, very short mention, uh, I currently work with the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise, uh, the GFC. Uh, for those of you not familiar, we are actually also like a platform or a member organizations for various actors that are involved in uh, especially capacity building issues and particularly related to uh, to uh, cyber security. Uh, and I think from, from the whole vision how the GFC wants to bring these actors together, it's also one of the organizations that has got how, how crucial it is to have uh, various uh, you know actors from all across the stakeholder spectrum uh, to get together and exchange uh, on issues related, uh, related to cyber um, uh, in particular. So I'll probably stop here and look forward to the discussion. <laughs> All right, now I'll turn to Marlena because uh, we did have a very extensive uh, position from Teresa on, on the engagement of civil society. So from the position of ECNL and advocacy position, could you bring your perspective on the topic, please? Sure, thanks so much, Pavlina, and hi, everyone. It's great to be here today. I'm Marlena Wisniak. I lead the Emerging Tech and AI work at the European Center for Nonprofit Law, um, a civic space and human rights organization based in Europe, and I live in San Francisco, so a lot of interaction with the tech companies, um, which I assume you mentioned as a stakeholder is often missing. Um, so just a couple opening remarks, and we'll dive deeper into the conversation, but um, at ECNL, we really see stakeholder engagement as a cross-cutting and necessary component of any kind of policy making at the national, regional, and global levels. And we really um, see it as a collaborative process. So it's not um, just a one-time mechanism where we hear someone speak, but it's an iterative process where folks have different um, ways to intervene depending on where they are, what their capacity is, what their resources are, and fundamentally that they can meaningfully influence the, um, the process, and that's like, something that's hard to quantify for now. Um, it's one thing to listen. It's another thing to actually have our voices heard and implemented. Um, and of course, uh, in, in terms of beyond IGF, just policy making and regulatory mechanisms in particular lie within the state. So decision making is um, member state or governments. Um, but I think there's, th there's more evidence um, that should be, or evidence uh, based research that should be done to really see how much of these consultations are impactful. Um, there's something also like stakeholder fatigue where we have lots of consultations. And to be clear, ECNL always pushes for multi-stakeholder participation and we are deeply concerned also about um, the future of IGF in particular, um, in including where IGF 2024 may be <laughs> um, for those who have heard. But um, uh, all this to say that um, it, it's not enough to just have multi-stakeholder. It has to be properly resourced, including not only financial participation, but also trainings, especially for organizations that aren't digital rights organizations so that they can meaningfully participate. And I'm thinking especially here, marginalized groups like feminist groups, qu queer, um, um, race, uh, racial justice, immigration, refugee groups so that their vo voices can also be heard in a way that is meaningful. And um, fundamentally, there is an asymmetry of power between stakeholders beyond the resource and financial access. Um, I don't think it's a secret that there's no level playing field between civil society, private sector, states. Um, and within these sector, these sectors are not a monolith either. So. There is no such thing as one singular civil society or one private sector. There's obviously a regional disparity. Um, I'm very privileged to work for a European-based organization living in San Francisco. So I can f pay my way to come to Japan. I don't even need a visa of a US and EU citizenship. So pretty much open to the entire world in terms of travel. That's not the same for most of my, my colleagues. I'm also generally much safer. Um, that's not the case for a lot of activists and human rights defenders around the world. So having in place mechanisms that enable safe participation is just as important as enabling participation in and of itself. And um, I will just end here. I know the rest of, cons um, the, confer ah, the, rest of the session will continue on these topics, that stakeholder engagement comes hand in hand with transparency. And that means that while closed door meetings are important and often necessary, 
there also needs to be public, um, transparent information about where to participate, how, what has been discussed, what are the outcomes of it to enable true accountability. Thank you. Thank you, Marlena. We certainly hear you on the um, running uh, marathons on sprint muscles, you know. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so, uh, we do face the same uh, issues uh, where the engagement of civil society in international four is a long term engagement, long term work, often decades. Uh, so, the proper mechanism, not only on the sides of um, international organizations, need to be in place, but systematically within the civil society organizations and within the funding scheme as well. Um, now, you mentioned also being from the Global North uh, organization and having certain privileges. I would like to turn to Victor from the Global South part and to tell us more about what challenges are faced in the Global South and the civil society organization's participation. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, from uh, Kicktonet, which is um, you know think tank based in Nairobi, uh, we seek to promote uh, the multi-stakeholder approach um, in the work that we do, and uh, to ensure that you know uh, outcomes are actually meaningful for communities at the local level. Um, we believe that the multi-stakeholder model is important, uh, not just. Um, in, um, in 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 governance, but also in IG governance, and some of the lessons that we've had from the internet space, we are trying to now um, <coughs> replicate in other policy making forums. Just for example, in Kenya, we have the um, uh, constitutional provision on public participation, which requires government bodies to consult the public whenever they're making public policy um, decisions, which is useful uh, for us, but it's not there in all the countries that, uh, you know, we are working in environments where, um, you know, the relationship between civil society and government is not always good, which uh, can affect, um, you know, the, um, the feedback or the responses to civil society proposals because civil society has sometimes been labeled as noisemakers, and therefore when you present views, you're just those noisemakers. So y in as much as um, you know, we have uh, the challenges at the local level, I think it is more difficult in um, global processes where you have the burden of getting the air ticket and the visa and all those many kilometers that you have to travel to make your point which um, sometimes is not the case for Global North organizations. Um, the, um, for, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, where we come from, um, the challenges of financing and uh, the cost um, is, is, is a challenge to, uh, you know, is a barrier to access. Um, issues around the technical capacity. We are aware that many organizations, uh, at least the internet reach hasn't been much and mainstream organizations are not focused a lot on digital rights or internet governance issues and um, as a result you have very few organizations that are working in the internet governance space and um, they, they, they cannot solve all the problems in as much as the problems are well known so you have few organizations which not they're not always uh, adequately resourced to with the capacity, whether it is human or financial or technical, to respond to all the challenges or emerging challenges in the region. And so only you're able to perhaps uh, take, um, I don't know, um, deal with, the, um, what is it called, the, the ice, <laughs> the, the tip of the iceberg, right? So maybe that's what they're able to deal with, but the bigger problems sometimes uh, remain unaddressed yet. We have an increasing population that is getting online uh, across the continents, and that means that uh, we need to be able to get more people on board to speak up uh, for all these new communities that are joining. Um, a new challenge is that you know previously the int it was easy to have multi stakeholder for internet because there weren't so many users, so now everybody uses. So who is the stakeholder? Who should be in and who should be out? And how can we bring these uh, conversations to everybody? Because everybody with an email account is, is a stakeholder, right? 
So getting people to actually recognize that they do have a voice and they should be able to speak up and engage, um, I think that realization has not um, uh, come for many people because then of of these uh, uh, barriers. And I think the other aspect is that, um, you know, for local organizations, you have very, very unique context which you're working in and different realities from those of the global south. And um, this perspective sometimes are not always, um, you know, it's not always possible to have them articulated in the spaces where the decisions are being made. Um, for example, I've participated in uh, OEWG sessions and um, other sessions where, um, you know, you, ha you are in the room but you don't get to speak. Uh, or <laughs> you're in the room but you are allocated only three minutes to say what uh, you need to say, and that's not always enough. Um, we are grateful for hybrid participation because it's a, it has really opened up um, the space for participation, but not everybody is uh, aware of the situation. And I think sometimes organizations in our countries are dealing with other problems like internet connectivity. So most of the time they're looking down trying to connect rural communities and trying to deal with the digital rights challenges at the local level, that they forget the big picture that actually there are global and regional processes that they need to pay attention to. So you end up dealing with home solutions or home problems, and when you hear that decisions are being made, you, you're like, but how, how am I supposed to get there and get my voice heard? So that, um, challenge of the disconnect uh, between the local work and the regional and global processes and even just being able to to deploy resources to keep up with the number of initiatives that are that are ongoing at the same time you know even for some people you speak to them on the corridors here and you know the confusion which session uh, you know you're one representative and there are how many meetings at IGF and you are the one person who's come and you want to make an impact. So uh, you may not have the capacity to attend, uh, you know, or figure out where to make the most impact. So, and of course that's a resourcing or something challenge. Of course now people can participate virtually, but there's that mountain that um, uh, global processes, original processes seem like a big mountain uh, to overcome. But I think um, not to paint a uh, all gloom picture, the situation has really changed from 10 years ago. We now have more people, we have more voices, and we have quite a number of local initiatives and organizations that are actually working on internet governance spaces. Um, just to give an example, Kicktanet, we have been running a Kenya School of Internet Governance for the past six years, and we have trained almost 500 people on internet governance, and that's only in Kenya. And we hope that with more people knowing what is happening, then they can be able to make at least a chip on that iceberg uh, to make a difference. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. There is a lot of points I could reflect on, but um, from the position of Diplo Foundation, that is something we see. And the main three main issues we see is uh, the fragmentation of forums where the internet governance is discussed it's more and more. Also forums which where the internet governance is discussed are going into more detailed discussions requiring more resources both uh, on capacity both on civil society organizations and governments because when we work with small and developing states they just say like I don't have the capacity to go in and speak every other week somewhere on this. Uh, so we, we definitely hear that. Another point is the lack of capacity of understanding of human rights impact of uh, technological development of standardization and um, of course civil society is also the technical community on that side it is from the other side it is from the side of the human rights implications where the understanding of technology is there but the implications uh, of what that technology when it is launched can affect is is sometimes not there so we we do have this gap we're trying to bridge and that is with capacity building that is with outreach and advocacy and basically creating networks of civil society organizations in the global south and connecting them to global north organizations which could support them and and uh, 
help help each other basically because global north organizations also do not you know possess all the knowledge in the world and bring those uh, issues which are not currently at the internet governance uh, forums but are on a regional or local level related for example to indigenous groups to to women's rights to certain cultural or language aspects of uh, internet governance to the global level so with that what can we do? <laughs> uh, we all agree it's beneficial to have civil society at the table. We all agree there are challenges to that, and what can we do? So Peter, if you could uh, maybe uh, expand on that and uh, explain to us where the uh, European Commission stands. Thank you, thanks very much. Uh, <coughs> again, I think, I'm not sure that I'm the best to, uh, to, to respond to that, but I'll, I'll give some, some thoughts. So I think actually that quite a few things have already been said, so I, I might be r repeating a few things. Uh, but okay, how can we make sure that there that there's more participation of civil society when if, if indeed that is needed? I think the first thing is that, um, well, not maybe the first, but one of the main things is that the capacity has to be there. I mean, to participate in the discussion, um, you have to have the, the, the know-how to participate. Um, or I'll say it differently, if you want to participate meaningfully, because indeed we can all participate, but to participate meaningfully you might um, need to have a little bit more knowledge on certain topics. doesn't mean we have to become ICT specialists, far from that. Actually, not at all, but we need to know um, the broader implications, where does it fit in society, in the processes, what are the political implications, who do we need to contact to have an impact, and all these things. So I think it's it's about capacity. Um, efforts are being done uh, at all levels, but you know it's simply the the scene is moving so fast that we're probably uh, running a little bit behind, especially maybe with the last few years. I'm just guessing, but I think maybe also with the COVID situation, the shift from society to move online has been quite dramatic. So and uh, this has maybe increased the world's uh, attention to these um, to these issues. And so to deal with this more adequately, you know, your, this capacity has to follow. So I think it's the first thing. I, I hope I'm responding part of the question. <laughs> Second is then, of course, apart from the know-how, even if you have the know-how, and it was mentioned here, then there's still the question of resources. Now you can follow hybrid, uh, or you can participate. We can do so many things uh, thanks to digital technology. Nevertheless, um, even if you don't travel, you need resources. You need people dedicated to to the work. Uh, but even and then, if you want to participate, of course, to to events, uh, you need other resources. Maybe to come back to um, one of the elements in this project um, that um, will start um, soon is that the idea is to participate. That CSOs have a meaningful participation at IGF, but also at other fora, such as um, fora of organizations, if I can say, uh, such as IETF. Uh, I can ITU. Well, to to meaningfully participate in ITU working groups, uh, it takes time, um, and so you need resources for that. Uh, simple. At the moment, it's companies and states backed. I think mainly, yeah, mainly operations that that are able to do that and therefore influence. Same for standard setting and so on. <coughs> if you don't have the the resources financially, also then then this is difficult. So we try to this project but there's many other ways other ways maybe to to partially respond to that um, and then maybe to to also underline uh, how come that maybe the voices were insufficiently heard just maybe reiterate that uh, maybe there has been an um, um, acceleration of events in the last couple of years because of COVID, <coughs> but also simply because of the ado adoption of technology. We've spoken also about connectivity, access. But then, of course, there's the new technologies. A AI is now the hot topic. <coughs> Maybe another day it will be something else. Um, I mean, it's a hot topic, but it's fundamental. Huh? I mean, I'm not um, <laughs> diminu uh, diminishing it. But uh, to, to be able to participate also in the discussions of AI, okay, and the big principles, I think everybody can do that. But to have a to really be on, on top of it, uh, again, um, you need to be able to invest in those uh, topics. Um,
Thank you. Now, I, I, I heard, and part of the project is, uh, is um, basically the involvement of civil society in different standardization for, as you mentioned. So ITU, ICANN, IATF, and as we all know in this room, not all of them are equal. Some of them are more open to civil society participation and um, transparent and have human rights uh, principles set in place for standard setting. Um, ITU and ITUT is, is uh, another one where the civil society, when the door is closed, they go through the window, basically, and become part of the government delegations and find different ways to, to get into one mm, example is Consumers International, who do it through the consumers' rights. Um, so there are ways to get engaged. It's not an easy one, I would say, but there are ways to get engaged in ways that once you have the capacity to understand where the connections are, how, how to advocate for certain human rights and human-centric values. Um, but let me t turn to Marlena to explain to us more on, on this uh, from the advocacy perspective again. Thank you. Sure, thanks. Um, so at ECNL, we participate in some of the standardization processes, mostly on AI, which is what my team focuses on. And um, like Peter said, it, it can be highly technical. So talking about things at the um, high level standard, at a high level principle level, such as um, transparency, participation, that is easier. But then, you know, what does tr transpa transparency mean in practice? What do we want to be transparent on? And we talk about the standards, um, it becomes much more technical, and that's something that we've seen as a struggle, especially to get more um, orgs involved. So m my team has expertise on these issues, but it really is a small group of people. And by small, for example, at the EU level, we're talking about like 10, um, comparing to hundreds, um, if not thousands, of representatives from the private sector, for example. So even you can, you know, you can see there quantitatively the difference. Um, and numbers and AI, for example, as you mentioned, Peter, is a hot topic now. Um, I, we started working on it um, in 2020, and I've been focusing on it since 2017. For a long time, it was incredibly niche, so even more close to civil society. And it was a handful, and I literally mean a handful of people working on it. And this year, probably with ChatGPT, um, that's my... <laughs> Um, on non-empirically tested theory, um, it has become a big topic on the policy level, right? So um, I don't know if anybody was here at UNGA in New York. AI was the topic uh, focused on everything. It, you know, UNGA is not even digital focused. So how do we ride these waves of hotness to <laughs> take your uh, piggyback on your hot word, Peter, um, while at the same time having Meaningful participation is a struggle. So um, specifically at ECNL, we participate in the ISO standard 42005 on impact assessment of AI systems. So you can hear already that here, um, how nerdy that sounds. Um, and when we have expertise in human rights impact assessments, which I think is a more broadly shared um, expertise among civil society, but still highly technical. Um, those working on the UNGPs, for example, should participate more. We're, we're also part of the uh, IEEE, which I don't even know what it stands for, International Electronic something. <laughs> um, I can Google it. On AI risk management, um, subgroup on organizational governance. Um, so all of this is you know, very technical as well at the EU. We, there's the SEN, SENELEC, which is the standardization bodies, and actually um, we managed to um, um, we managed to get the European Commission to let me get this right mandate that the SEN, SENELEC includes civil society, and actually um, they have allocated resources. So SEN, SENELEC, the standardization bodies, have allocated resources to include external stakeholders, and yet they still don't do it. Um, so even when they are required to do so by the commission and when they get funds, they're still very reticent. And when it actually does happen, it's really, really hard to participate. Right now, to give you an example, it's mostly ECNL, Article 19, and Center for Democracy and Technology um, that participates in a handful of academics. So it, it's, really, um, it's really a closed space. And when it, per, when, when I'd say, honestly, pretends to be open, it's not, even though they, um, 
if people have the best intentions. And um, I'd say one positive case study that I've seen is in the US NIST, National Institute for Standardization Standards and Technology, I think. Um, they have been very inclusive in um, engaging certain stakeholders in the risk assessment framework. Um, and also have made it more a little bit more welcoming. But again, you still see a disproportionate participation of not only digital rights orgs, but those uh, with expertise on AI specifically. So um, there's always this push and pull between inclusiveness versus needed expertise. In the DCNL, we really try to, um, to train other CSOs, both digital rights and non-digital rights on these issues. If anyone here in this room is interested, check out our learning center. So shameless plug for <laughs> ECNL Learning Center on Google, where we have a couple, um, like basically courses specifically for CSOs um, on AI with some specific things like surveillance technology or platforms um, so that you can participate a little bit more. And this is just the technical expertise in addition to obviously the challenges of um, visa and funding and everything I mentioned before. Thank you, Marlena. I'm happy there are so also some positive <laughs> examples because it, it did for a while sound like doom and gloom here. Um, we do not have any questions online, but if there are any questions in the room, please feel free. Uh, we'll also have a Q&A se session uh, at the end of, 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 of this uh, block of questions. Um, I, I see a lot of familiar faces, so please don't be shy to come to the microphone. I know it's a little scary to go in the middle of the room sometimes and ask a question. But uh, feel free to also share your experiences if you have any with, with these processes and how they relate. Um, any takers so far? Okay. It's a bit tall for me, sorry. Hi, my name's Don. I'm with Article 19's uh, Global Digital Program. We've uh, worked to support civil society organizations and individuals primarily from the global south to participate in technical standard setting bodies. So like everything you've said like really resonates. Um, just also, also what we've found has been useful when we're working with civil society organizations is being able to identify their priorities and then aligning it with what would be useful within technical standards bodies because we recognize, as you said, it's like a whole fragmented um, landscape. And even within, tech within standards developing organizations, there are just dozens and dozens of working groups and study groups within each one. And it can be quite overwhelming for um, organizations to jump into, say, like the IETF and work out which of the 36 meetings they should be attending, like you said. Um, so we've actually been working to develop engagement strategies, so being able to support them. Um, and we take on a lot of the, um, we institutionalize a lot of the support structures. So like in terms of the financial capacity, in terms of like working on the visa processes, like we kind of take care of that. So that organizations and individuals from the Global South don't need to necessarily have to like put in time and effort to focus on that, but rather scope out the work, be able to understand the concepts that are being brought up. Um, and then we've also done a lot of one-on-one -on -one mentorship and engagement because we also recognize that these standards bodies have a monoculture. It's a very like technical space, but it's also very like e Europe and US dominant. And so being able to have someone to go with you to these meetings um, really helps because I think after these meetings, a lot of the times people are often processing what they've learned, what they've heard. Um, and so being able to have like someone to be able to bounce ideas and thoughts with um, post this. So it was just some, just sharing some of our experience. Thank you, that resonates very well with, uh, with the project we're about to start, where it, there, there was a big study done by, by one of the partners for us, which found that um, especially standardization bodies are male dominated, white dominated, English speaking, uh, inaccessible to any type of variety of opinions. Uh, by design, uh, so the the that's why we're talking about the running the marathon, that um, it it needs to be slowly chipped off and and introduced uh, the different opinions from presented by the civil society organizations. Um, you also mentioned, and I know Victor spoke about it, 
the participation uh, from the Global South organizations on how we can help them. Um, part of what we will be doing is um, there's a three-pronged approach. This part is capacity building that we will be responsible for. Um, one part is advocacy and bringing in grassroots opinions and networking between the uh, civil society organizations. Um, but also helping those who are ready to do so in engaging w with these forums, in engaging uh, through guidance on, on, uh, and on how to write a briefing, for example. How do you go in and, and present it? What is the best strategy of in being involved in these processes to achieve the goals of your organization? Um, with that, I would like to turn back to Victor, maybe, and ask you about um, if you could elaborate a little bit of the benefits of building partnerships between the organizations, both Global North and Global South, and Global South, Global South civil society organizations. I think the, the various uh, advantages to this uh, collaboration. I think first is it addresses the, the, the problem of uh, the lack of linkages that uh, existed with, with you know, across the various digital rights organizations. We realize that coalition building is very important and collaborative approaches are equa even more important because we are working to solve the same problem or similar problems, if at all. So having that alignment um, that um, you know, we are able to share our concerns collectively and figure out what are some of the 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 key emerging themes that we want to address i think that's that's a, that's that's an important win um the second is that um it takes advantage of you know the competencies of of both organizations if for example um there is an event in um in um you know geneva where one of the global north organization is based it's easier for them to cross the road and uh, present uh, the views or ask for a meeting uh, than it is for me from to come from Nairobi to get visa and you know struggle through trams to make the point. So that scaling uh, becomes easy because uh, of physical presence and uh, understanding also the local dynamics. The Global North organizations which work closely, whether it is at the UN in New York or EU in Brussels, they have built relationships with the various uh, policy makers in those various offices and therefore when uh, we come there it's easy to you know this is the person to talk to don't <laughs> go around or the office is on fifth floor room number five simple things such as that make a big difference because when you arrive uh, at the you know it is a big uh, space and having someone who has that local understanding really helps. Um, the other is that it also helps in terms of uh, capacity building and uh, knowledge exchange between the two organizations. Global North organizations may not understand perfectly 100% the context in uh, Global South countries. And so this discussion help in terms of sharing knowledge and exchanging ideas like what works for us and what works for you and how then can we build on this? Uh, we're able to, um, you know, present, um, you know, sometimes um, access to our government officials is usually difficult uh, at the national level uh, because, you know, you can't access a minister uh, easily. But sometimes if you're able to participate in a global forum, then you're able to meet the, the delegation there and still be able to articulate the issues. So. Um, there is a there is the benefit of um, learning from the organizations that have done it before, in terms of even knowing what to say and how to say it, and maximizing that two minutes that perhaps you will have with that person before they dash into the next meeting and say these are the three things that we need you to do, and also leveraging on the other partnerships that you know we know within the. Uh, global circles, uh, influential governments, and so on, and all these alignments, and the mapping, the power mapping that perhaps that skill the Global North organizations have already done and have understood who the power brokers are. Uh, I can have my three issues and know who to tell them to, 
as opposed to going there and wondering where to start from 200 member states. You know, so that uh, beneficial um, partnership is very useful. It's an uh, advantage. And of course, uh, more importantly, the resources. Uh, they are able to uh, leverage um, the technical resources in terms of skill. Um, for example, some of this, the IETF, the IE, they're very technical. And Global South organizations, we might not have a technical person like an ICT person because now it is becoming uh, an, an important component that a human rights organization is not just lawyers. You must have the techies there and you must <laughs> have the engineers and you know so on because some of the issues, I remember once one a government official told me we are discussing spectrum and I'm going there, I'm saying, yes, we want to hear about human rights concerns with this spectrum. And I'm like, okay, so who do I <laughs> bring to <laughs> say these things and to break down what spectrum actually means um, for the ordinary citizen on the street? So leveraging on a partnership, we were able to get uh, engineers who've done it before and have best practice that then they could be able to review the submission that we were doing and give some perspective. So there are some uh, unique benefits to those alliances. And if we are able to build um, strong coalitions between Global South organizations and also with Global North organizations, because I think there is a certain power that we can have when we work collaboratively. And I think lastly is um, um, for funders, because we, we have, there's a significant problem uh, when we have different funders who are funding different things and, you know, it's all disjointed and fragmented and they're supporting the same organizations who are competing for the same basket of funds to do the same problem, to attack the same problem. And so when they're not coordinated, it is also creating problems for civil society organizations in terms of coordination because, uh, you know, we are competing for the same EU grant. Uh, so do I partner with you or do I partner or do I go solo? And does collaborating affect the opportunities? And are the, f are the donors, um, you know, goals aligned with the specific needs of people to help organizations collaborate? And I think it is important that funders appreciate the dynamics of Global South organizations and the impact of uh, the funding and how they model those funds in terms of the ease of access and how they can help build and uh, strengthen uh, civil society in the Global South to actually make a strong impact. Yeah. Thank you, Victor. And I'm having a stereo here, one side, Teresa, and the other side, Marlena, who want to both chip in <laughs> on the what you said. So, Teresa, you start, and then I'll give word to Marlena. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, no, I think what you raised uh, is very, very important, Victor, because. Um, Mm. There is a problem, and I, I will comment a little bit on on the on the donor experience. Yes, because uh, you're you're very right. You know that um, first of all, like for civil society organizations to be able to be involved in some of the policy fora, it has to be a deliverable in a project. You know, because otherwise, yeah, no no way <laughs> how to make it work. Uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, among donors, there might not be kind of sufficient um, yeah, coordination of the priorities. You know, uh, in this uh, in this sense. So, uh, uh, if I can also encourage donors, you know, who um, are interested in uh, more meaningful participation of civil society in, in various uh, various policy policy fora, like you have probably identified already um, uh, it's really important also to talk to other donors and to uh, and to try to uh, not overwhelm also uh, civil society organizations with each donors coming with a specific narrow vision uh, you know project uh, perspective uh, it could be ultimately more impactful uh, if uh, if this is done while I'm aware that it's not uh, it's not an easy and intuitive uh, intuitive task Another point that uh, I would like to elaborate on super quickly is what you, Marlena, actually raised, uh, and that sometimes uh, this bad habit of like 
tick the box uh, approach of like consulting civil society. You you also mentioned it actually in your in your intervention. It's actually tough to consult civil society because the civil society is not like okay, I I have consulted civil society. No, it's uh, it's so many various organizations with various agendas, uh, various um, uh, various objectives. So uh, it's uh, certainly not easy. But on the other hand, uh, we are sometimes sliding or experiencing this tick the box, like you know there is some pro forma consultation that not necessarily leads to anything, but you can you can say that you've done it, yes? And yeah, let's be honest, some policy fora are more prone to this uh, than, uh, uh, than, uh, than others. So yeah, I, d I don't have a solution, uh, but um, just raising uh, the voice of the civil society more and having, having donors that, uh, that have realized and identify uh, this issue is a, is a strong start. Uh, thanks. Um, and following up on Victor's intervention, I wanted to bring another perspective also from um, a Global North organization that the corporation, cooperation and collaboration between Global North and Global South or majority based orgs isn't only f like, or and definitely should not take this like white saviorist approach um, where we uplift global majority based orgs. But also there's a lot to learn for Global North orgs. Um, there's so much resistance in many countries outside the US and Europe with really creative advocacy strategies. Um, and I and my team learn constantly and I think the, the global coalitions are inherently better when there are diverse perspectives as well and it can be pretty easy to to become complacent or even lazy to some extent when you live in the US or Western Europe, you forget many of the fundamental issues of organizing um, and, and influencing policymakers. So that's something um, to remember. And another aspect is that a lot of the interna uh, international governance mechanisms, um, even like UNESCO recommendations, for example, rarely, uh, I, I will not offend UN people here, but they don't have as much influence in the EU and US. However, they do have a disproportionate impact on national regulation in um, the global majority. So for example, UNESCO guidelines for digital platforms are often portrayed to be a digital services act or DSA-esque version of the EU. There's also the recommendations on ethical AI. Um, the EU has its AI Act, so there's reg binding regulation in the EU. The US is, you know, a bipartisan politics aside, also has its own regulation. However, a lot of the, um, the recommendations from these, um, these entities, including then like UN, Angaro, CHR, really can influence and often are weaponized to um, enforce problematic regulation at the national level around the world. So that's something to consider when we have these coalitions. Um, and then fundamentally, I mentioned before that civil society is not a monolith. The global majority is definitely not one either. It's multiple regions. The regions themselves are not homogenous and um, even in terms of languages. If one individual country, India has, I don't even know how many languages, 60, how many? 27, okay, I thought it was more than that. Um, official, yeah, so plus the dialects, right? So um, differences between, with um, differences of languages, um, social norms, economies um, between and within countries. So that's something to consider. And I'll give an example, um, um, which is something that ha uh, we've been working on with Access Now, uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation, and a lot of other organizations, including I think Article 19 on um, the SA Human Rights Alliance, which is involving global majority based orgs in the implementation of the DSA, which is the leading um, EU regulation on digital platforms. And what we're trying to do with Diplo um, and the orgs represented here is really to bring in um, learnings from that experience um, and others into um, international, governan I international governance of uh, the internet. Thank you, Marlena. And uh, we have questions in the room. So, Jovan, please start, and then the lady in the blue dress. Oh. Both. You go. After you. <laughs> you're going after okay. you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, you're next. Okay. Uh, ju just one building on what, what Victor said, what we can call power of triviality. 
we very often think, uh, discuss big system, but sometimes to navigate the UN corridors in Geneva, New York, or knock on the office, or I remember still when uh, we had a program for the colleagues, students from the developing countries, even where you leave the jacket during the winter, or what do you do? I mean, it sounds completely trivial, but it impacts the feeling of being part of the process. And I will bring you a few examples that we have been recently focusing on. PDF is dominant format of the UN, European Union, and other actors. With PDF, you cannot do a lot if you want to interact, if you want to display it nicely. We took the European AI Act, and we were in Brussels discussing with different negotiators. If you try to consult European EU Act draft, which is now negotiated between Commission, uh, Council, and Parliament, you simply, uh, you're lost. On the very trivial level, not on knowledge of AI, but on displaying three columns, four columns, one PDF, 300 pages. The, what we did, uh, we basically organized it in the simple way that you at least can read it and then have obviously expertise to analyze and to have a context. The similar applies for the UN Secretary General policy briefs. If you read these policy briefs and you can consult on Digital Watch, they're d done by designer who wanted to have nice printed publication. And this is the mindset, you can see the mindset. And said, who is going to, maybe at meeting like AGF, you, they will distribute, have a nice publication, as we are doing, all of us, you know. But in reality, people will consult it online, or they're mobile. Therefore, uh, this power of triviality, which ultimately shapes people's participation, is a big thing. And we plan during, uh, in this project, to focus on these things. And one of the elements is the reporting from the IGF. You have here the paper. This session will be reported by a mix of AI and experts. You have yesterday's sessions with main points. And why is this important for the civil society? It is important because you simply have a limited resources to navigate such a flow of information and sessions in Kyoto, but also last 18 or 19 years. And frankly, some issues, digital divide, were basically rehearsed every year and you have the more or less similar, similar narratives. Therefore, this is again one small thing. If small NGO, we had discussion two days ago from Brazil with two or three persons, wants to know exactly what is about child protection discussed during the IGF. Not necessarily AI, not necessarily other issues. They should have the access. And it's not as easy as it looks. Therefore, we are trying uh, with, uh, with this reporting, you can consult it, to use a mix of AI, deploy AI system, and our experts, mainly to bring to the help with the small uh, developing countries, who are the, our main uh, sort of, to, to bring them substantively in discussion, but also small civil society and marginalized groups. Therefore, those are a few points we write, which I invite all of us here to reflect on this uh, power of triviality, and there are tools, and also to create a space, uh, I call it AI hallucination, of human hallucination, to think, I won't go too far with the way how to hallucinate, but to create a space for a bit of alternative thinking. My criticism of all actors, and mea culpa, is that we sometimes become domesticated in global fora. We basically start integrating thinking of the IGF governments, which is very human. You interact and you basically develop the thinking. And the time which we are facing, you open Al Jazeera, CNN, news, and you see the world is not in the best shape. And we need alternative thinkings, and we need the uh, creative inputs. And I think this is the role for civil society and academia, where they are not contributing. I'm sorry to say, but we are not contributing uh, to this. Therefore, those are just a few points which uh, um, influence Diplo's approach, and we hope that together with the partners in this project, we'll try to do this power of triviality, making things accessible to people, and also trying to create a space where we can think a bit uh, out of the box for the benefit of the governments, uh, public, and uh, global public good. Well, should I ask some question? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. We'll have a lady in a blue dress and then the gentleman in a blue shirt and Mewish and 
four questions coming up. Thank you for interesting um, thoughts from different perspective and different, um, different experiences. And I'd like to ask you about, the, uh, uh, about a question uh, regarding capacity building. Since I, I, I am Emmy from Japan, <laughs> working at a, um, a private company um, giving um, OSINT-related service, uh, giving more reliable information to mainly researchers. Um, I think capaci capacity building is, cannot be made one day, but um, for, for example, since I'm familiar with climate change um, issues um, uh, process, um, there were uh, uh, around the Paris Agreement, and there were a, a, a citizen assembly, citizen congress, uh, with uh, randomly sampled uh, citizens um, without any expertise um, discussing uh, the very important issue about climate change. And that didn't really solve all the problems, uh, but it moved forward um, somehow. So uh, how would you think about such process in uh, regarding this um, issue and also uh, the possibility or threats or uh, limitation of such, uh, what do you say, uh, citizen participation in, in uh, very uh, local level. And I, 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 my, my uh, personal hope is to have such uh, Congress in different um, areas, different parts of the world, and then they can make, have capacity building and also participate in global level, and so I'd like to know the opinions. Thank you. Any takers? No, I, it should be me on capacity building, but Peter, go first. <laughs> I'll, I'll try, <coughs> but I, I'm, I'll, I will pass to you afterwards for sure. Well, first of all, thanks a lot. Um, shall I take, I'll, I'll, I'll respond to that and maybe give some feedback on other points. So. Um, First of all, yeah, I, I, I don't know if this <laughs> is planned or has been done. I, I do think it's interesting. Uh, you make me think of, I think, what the th one of the speakers in one of the other panels recently said, I forgot her name, the, the Nobel uh, laureate um, journalist, um, who said that she, had, um, she hasn't done this, but she had interviewed, um, if I understand correctly, quite randomly, a few hundred or a few thousand people. Uh, and, and she said, uh, if I correctly remember the, the topic randomly, like you say, uh, just citizens which are not experts, right? And, that, and and also have their impact. So, I mean, I think that's interesting, okay, as part of the consultation process. I'm not an expert in all these consultation process, but I'm, 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 I think there can be space for that. I'm sure academics will have more to say about that. Um, I do know that in, in the EU processes, when it comes to legislation, there are consultation processes, quite large ones. But maybe they're not so intimate. Uh, maybe they're like, uh, look, this is online, and you can uh, you can share your opinions. I know that on some of these um, consultations, we do have thousands, if not tens of thousands, of inputs from society. Some of them are even indeed analyzed partially by AI, because it's not possible to you know read every one of them. Um, so I, th I think there's some interest for that. Now I think um, specifically, it's more to our partners in you know in the CSO organizations who might give a bit more, yeah. Yes, so um, it makes me think of two things. One is the capacity building we're talking about is institutional co capacity building. So when we uh, talk about increasing the engagement, it, it is in a way we're training people, but we are increasing the institutional capacity of civil society organization. Person may come, may go, but you need to have within the organization the knowledge, the expertise, whether technical or policy, to engage. And we have ways to do that. Well, I'm not going to go into that because we're running out of time in, in general. But going back on the consulting um, regular people on in the process and also Jovan's point on the basic triviality of things, I remember one example on accessibility where a blind person was able to access government's um, website going through accessible government website, going to get their ID, they went through everything, and they got to the end, and we're supposed to tick the boxes with the bicycles to prove that they're not a robot. 
And the person is like, it's a trivial thing which can be replaced by a small technical solution. But because that trivial thing is not in a forum and it's not addressed, it causes issues of accessibility on a wider scale to certain groups of, of uh, people. So it, it is a two-way two -way thing. Now the fora we're speaking about, the Internet Governance Fora, Standardization Fora, are way less um, open to, to uh, direct uh, engagement with the public or with the individuals. Um, in the environmental sector and uh, also in youth and uh, rights of youth to, to their future, that, it, that is way more open uh, to do this. And also there was a uh, court case in Germany which established the right of youth to their future uh, in relation to the environmental rights. So the movement there is uh, a little bit different. I think the burning planet might have something to do with it. There's a little more urgency. But we do have three more questions in the room, and I don't want to forget about them. So gentlemen in blue shirt. Oh, okay. And then over there. Uh, hi. Arjun Adrian D'Souza, uh, Legal Counsel at Software Freedom Law Center. I'm here with my colleague. Uh, just wondering, um, so we have spoken about uh, capacity building as well, and we are a civil society based out of New Delhi, India. So India presently is at an inflection point, a very opportune time also. Uh, we've had a Personal Data Protection Act which has been uh, enacted, it is yet to come into force, uh, and a Digital India Act which will regulate platforms. So the stakes are high, we are uh, going to be dealing with 1.4 billion people who will be regulated through these provisions. Uh, just as a civil society, we've seen the pushback that is there in terms of engagement. So my question is twofold. Firstly, uh, in terms of putting forth a consolidated front on behalf of civil societies and think tanks, uh, any strategies, any advice on that? And secondly, uh, to the gentleman's question also, any alternative uh, points of engaging with um, parliamentarians and government for the simple fact that uh, this may be a jurisdiction specific issue to India, but the consultation process prior to the introduction of a bill is much more fruitful than the one that usually, uh, um, uh, uh, which comes for, uh, for after that. So just wanted your views on that. Anyone? Victor, go, then I'll go. <laughs> yes, that's a very interesting. We face uh, similar situations uh, in Kenya with consultation. I think some of the strategies that have worked for us, uh, one is um, to build a relationship um, with uh, the legislators. I think it's important to have that relationship uh, with them uh, before you submit the view so that they know that there is this body and this is what you do. Um, I think the second is uh, usually to demonstrate the expertise that, that is being brought um, to the table. I know it's usually a higher standard for civil society organizations being placed, but I think demonstrating that you actually have value to add and you bring that value uh, will add some weight to the, to the um, comments that um, uh, you present. And I think the third is uh, you know, to work collaboratively with other civil society organizations. I think sometimes it helps when you have 20 sign-ons as opposed to one. And so identifying the common issues across the various groups is, is essential in as much as there could be uh, variances in terms of positions, but at least there should be some key things that um, everybody wants that, you know, fee or feel is important to articulate and coalesce around that. And I think, lastly, just to say that um, be ready for, you know, the, the marathon. So, you know, you need to go to the gym and work out. So have your arguments and counter arguments, you know, prime because you need to be ready for the views of the other stakeholders. You know, not everybody will agree with your positions. Just because you're civil society doesn't mean you're always right or that your position will be taken. So uh, it's important to build the, the watches in terms of understanding the arguments or potential arguments and other scenarios that the other stakeholders could bring forth. 
and the other push and pull factors that uh, and drivers, uh, you know, what is driving this and who is driving this and understanding um, that local context which you, which you probably do. And then it helps that when you get to the floor and the question is asked, you understand and you're able to anticipate and then have a very good response to, um, to any scenario because at least you have prepared for it as opposed to just walking in and thinking that it's gonna be a smooth ride. It, most of the time it's uh, not always, at least from our experience. Thank you. Peter, did you wanna reflect on that? Uh, yes. <coughs> I, wa I want to be, how should I say, a bit sensitive in, uh, in what I say because of course your question is to CSOs and, uh, and, and <coughs> I'm, I'm speaking in the name of co commission, but maybe just to say that from experience in some other countries, um, we have had um, governments in other countries, including Kenya, for example, um, knocking on our door to discuss exactly this kind of topic and um, in an open spirit, where we have then engaged some of our experts, for, for example, our Director General Justice, um, to go into dialogue. And they even came on a, on a visit. And and so uh, I think if, if there's a way of creating this trusted uh, relationship and, and this willingness for open dialogue, then of course it's of course difficult for you to create this, but I mean, if, if that can somehow be found to the right people or the right uh, entry, then um, maybe um, that's um, helpful and second. But here again, I want to be really careful that I don't give any wrong message, but you might also indeed knock on the door of ad other organizations that, that you think might have uh, the entry and uh, it can be a, a national organization or an international organization that's locally present with an office and uh, that m might have better channels of access and then through that way maybe uh, open the dialogue. Um. Yes, we have the last question and while you're going to the microphone I'm just gonna quickly reflect on the, on the um, calls for common inputs by CSOs in different processes and I would like to maybe caution and um, say that there needs to be a balance between one input by several organizations and basically leaving the variety of uh, opinions and variety of perspectives behind because you are eliminating certain aspects of that in, in the process so that is something as a CSO you need to be aware of what is it that you are not presenting in a way when you are trying to make a certain different point stronger? So that, that is a balance exercise, at least in our opinion. Please go ahead. Hi, so this is less of a question and more of a comment that speaks to kind of everything we've discussed here, but uh, my name is Ariel McGeed. I work with Internews and um, congratulations on your proposal. Uh, we actually also just won a very similar proposal. Um, from the Department of State working in South Asia. So I'll be implementing that as well and would love to kind of collaborate with you guys, um, working on bringing our civil society organizations together, but also to speak to your um, topic, one of our parts of our activities are creating an online space where all of our civil society and human rights groups can kind of come together and work together around what they're learning um, and at the final, we have bringing them to this, um, sessions such as IGF and really being able to advocate. Um, I had one other thought as well. But yeah, so speaking to how donors are not collaborating with each other, and so you have the EU, we have State Department, very similar projects, um, and obviously the work needs to be done everywhere, but would be great to kind of bring together inner news into the reflection as well. No, absolutely, thank you, and I would love to talk to you in the corridor afterwards. Um, it is um, our intention within this project to actually harness what is already in place and what is going on to create a wider network of CSOs and um, kind of build up on each other and cross-pollinate whatever is in the space currently and whatever is going to be in the space in the future because we do believe that beyond the project itself that that is something we will be dedicating more and more time in the future as well. So, and with this, you can find us all 
individually if you want to talk more but i believe we can we can close this session if that's okay with everybody or is there more questions oh, okay sure go ahead i just wanted to um, share something uh, just to build on what victor and marlena said i come from sflc india and like you mentioned that we have a lot of languages i think the one problem that we face is um, with my legal team and with my technology team, they come up with these brilliant blog posts or write-ups to you know, share information or create awareness. But sometimes the language is so complex that the people they're trying to make aware find it difficult. So one of the, yes, uh, one of the benefits of local partnerships is that um, you know, when I meet other lo um, CSOs for these kind of events, I realize that all of us are facing the same issue, especially from the comms and PR team. So yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, thank you for bringing that up because these kind of local partnerships help up, help you know bring issues to light that sometimes I think go unnoticed. So I just thank you. No, thank you, thank you for that point, and it's uh, another one. Okay. <laughs> yes, yes, we do. We do have, I believe, still eight minutes to go, so we can go ahead. Perfect. I'm Camila. I'm from EDAC in Brazil. And Pavlina, you were mentioning that uh, beyond the substantial issues on how to participate on this space, we have formal rules to uh, to interact on this space. And this is so hard. We don't have a book on that. If you are in the UN, you have a way to interact. If you are in other spaces, you have other ways. So how can we... Uh, share more information about that. You were mentioning, for example, that we can make a workshop on how to make a breathing, uh, briefing on all these spaces, but how can we share this kind of knowledge? Thank you. No, and you're absolutely right about um, each of the processes, each of the open work, uh, open ended working groups uh, uh, having a different way of engaging civil society. Uh, we have seen it, for example, on the open ended working group on cyber how from the first uh, session to the second one, uh, the temperature in the room changed and all of a sudden civil society is not automatically included in the conversation. So it is a challenge from the procedural side to see where are the ways to get engaged and that is part of what we will be doing in different fora. For, for example, within the standardization processes and. Marlena, I know you do a lot of work on there, so if you, if you feel later on uh, chiming in on that. Um, there are, as I mentioned, certain standardization bodies uh, which are more open to civil society participation uh, beyond, beyond the technical community. Um, they do have principles uh, in place, human rights principles and human-centric standard uh, making processes in place. There are other ones which are not open. And there are certain ones which are just multilateral. And that is the world we live in. It would be very ideal to have one way uh, within, for example, UN or any other body to have um, this is how you, how you go ahead and uh, do it and put your input. Um, another part to that is once you overcome that challenge of how you are going to participate, how are you going to put across your points, is whether those points are, as, as Teresa mentioned, are tick on the box yeah. or they are taken seriously. And that is um, a question of building partnerships, at least in my opinion. It is a question of working in that space for a long time, knowing who does what, knowing uh, the trends, knowing what's coming up, where, where is the place to be, and which forum you need to be strategically engaged to, to achieve your civil society goals. Um, so not an easy one, <laughs> definitely not. Marlena, but you did some work on that, so maybe some lessons learned. I mean, I was going to bring up your last point that unfortunately it's a lot of informal networks um, that we see, so you know, many of, I mean, many folks in this room um, I know, right? So that's both a good thing and a bad thing. Um, same people on panels generally bad the I'd say one good thing is that we do have tight networks between civil society so we're able to you know text each other um, and and have monthly meetups like they're different I think there's also a lot of uh, coalitions 
so it's hard to know um, who does what and like how to be coordinated um, and aligned. That's always um, always a struggle. I mean, um, colleague from Internews mentioned that there's a similar initiative, and we work very closely with Internews. We're even part of the Global Internet Freedom, I think, um, and we didn't even know about this, right? So, <laughs> um, so I think there's definitely it, it's it's incredibly difficult. Um, and also unfortunate because it can become a cool kids club of if you're in it, then you have, and uh, generally to be to have these connections, you already are privileged and well-networked, and then it gives you an even bigger boost to actually be, um, to have the platform, right? So, um, so uh, yeah, I think it's our responsibility of the orgs that are in this room to actually bring in new voices. Um, something that I've been experimenting with is if I'm invited to a panel, I either decline and give my spot to someone else, or I say yes under the condition that um, the other person comes. Um, I didn't do that at this panel. Um, apologies, <laughs> <laughs> or like apologies, are, you're welcome. Um, but yeah, so different, I think, yeah, bringing in more people, but unfortunately it is informal. And then, like you mentioned, uh, I forgot who mentioned, some of the orgs are better at um, inclusion than others. Um, the UN is, is really, really difficult. I do a lot of UN advocacy and I don't really understand it. <laughs> um, we have a UN advocacy um, officer at our organization and we're very lucky to have. Um, so he, he knows a lot on the procedural side. Um, and then he doesn't have the substantive expertise as much. And my team is the opposite. We know um, AI and human rights, but don't really know where to intervene or what, unless it's the very specific like everybody knows IGF, right? But the, the smaller ones, it's hard to know. So sorry, it's not a satisfactory answer. Basically make friends, be social, <laughs> and share your contacts and your privilege. If I can quickly, just a story from earlier this morning, yes, on the kind of encouraging everybody to be more experimenting in panel compositions. I was on a panel and probably I had some calming effect on two other uh, ladies uh, speaking in the same panel and they were like, this is my first time doing a panel, this is going to be a disaster. And I told them, no, <laughs> first of all, it's not going to be a disaster, but you belong on this panel much more than, than I do, for instance. And um, by the way, they did great. Yes. <laughs> so, so uh, don't be afraid uh, to experiment uh, when when you when you put panels together, because um, yeah, it might uh, seem easier to go with people you know or you have worked before, but actually, it might get much fresher uh, look um, if you if you get new new people. Thank you. And with this, there were three people on this panel I didn't know <laughs> so so far. <laughs> So only Teresa, so with this, I will invite you to get to know each other and we'll close up. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.